energy transition. Uh, one of the reasons why we coordinate this project, we have, uh, since many years, we have a dedicated program to promote EPC here in our region, and that has resulted in one of the densest EPC markets uh, in Europe, with more than 200 EPC projects implemented in our region. What was the starting point for this project? So, as all of you who are online probably know, um, EPC, in principle, energy performance contracting, is a great instrument. However, it hasn't been able to succeed on the market on its own. Now, we saw an opportunity in 2014 um, in the streetlight sector uh, to change this uh, because, uh, similar to incandescent light bulbs, also streetlight uh, lamps are being phased out. So there is quite a pressure for municipalities to act. We have at the same time a new technology, LED, that at the, that time new, that offers high savings with comparatively short payback times. And street lighting is a good learning and testing ground for EPC because it has a significantly lower complexity than uh, other EPC solutions. So we felt that this is really an opportunity to overcome some of these market uh, barriers. So what are they? We, we call them the chicken and egg problem. There's no demand for EPC because no one understands it. There's no knowledge. And to, it's very difficult for ESCOs in such a market to develop such a service. Uh, all this has been discussed many, many times in many projects, but we thought that these phasing out uh, pressure uh, plus the new LED um, technologies coming on the market is a real opportunity for starting EPC markets. That is why we submitted uh, and were awarded the Streetlight EPC project, uh, which is coming to an end uh, in less than two months. And so what we are doing is we are triggering the market uptake of EPC through street lighting refurbishment in nine European regions. How do we do it? We create demand and supply for EPC uh, through so-called EPC facilitation services that we'll explain in a moment what this is. And we have also performed real life procurement of EPC projects in the course of uh, this project. And here you can see uh, below our project team, which consists of nine regional energy agencies uh, that basically provide the facilitation support, nine cities in the respective regions, and Federen, our European network. So here you can see which countries we are talking about and which region. And I take the opportunity of also welcoming uh, the those of the project partners who are also participating in the webinar and invite you to also bring in your own experiences uh, through our chat function. So as you can see, nine different countries with very different starting points for EPC. Uh, and so, uh, of course, we had to take a strategic approach. Uh, the key of the strategic approach is this so-called facilitation service. Uh, it interests and connects actors uh, in our respective regions. It identifies promising candidate projects. And then, once we've done that, we provide comprehensive support both to the clients, the potential clients, so mostly municipalities in our case, and also to potential ESCOs in developing the project and implementing the project. This is uh, an initial assessment, for example, of the economic and technical viability of such projects, supporting project audits and providing, for example, guidance on procurement rules, contractual, technical issues, and financing. The way we developed the services in the eight regions, because our service already existed, uh, first, of course, we had to increase our internal knowledge and prepare tools to use in, the, in that service. Then a key element was identifying and reaching out to potential projects and stakeholders. And the third step is then uh, the support to specific projects in development and implementation. 
So here you can see some of the tools we prepared in the course of this project. Uh, quick checks uh, to help and be available in 10 different languages. These quick checks, they help, quick checks, they help us in a first very rough in an assessment whether it's worthwhile to give this project a further consideration, a guide on how to do it, and FAQs. Here, is, uh, here are some of the activities uh, of the facilitation service in these last two and a half years. So we held more than 50 events. We uh, had these quick checks completed. We answered nearly 400 inquiries. There are FAQs available. And we held more than 50 meetings with financing bodies. In terms of supporting specific project development and implementation, so in overall, we gave the detailed support to more than 75 projects. 50 of them were street lighting projects, and 25 were indoor lighting projects. One key um, lesson we saw is that really, no EPC market is like the other, and the challenges that have to be overcome differ significantly. So in some regions, the problem was mainly uh, that uh, there were no ESCOs, uh, but quite a significant interest by municipalities. In other regions, it was the other way around. There were ESCOs, but the municipalities were very reluctant. What uh, was common to all uh, regions, and it's still the case also in our own region uh, was the lack of information. Uh, and that meant we had to explain, explain, explain. And this is one of the fundamental functionalities of the first facilitation service is keep explaining, keep uh, answering questions, keep pushing uh, both municipalities and, and ESCOs or potential ESCOs towards specific project. Now, the good news is uh, now we can say at the end of this project, facilitation does work. We have implemented more than 40 projects. 30 of them use a variety of EPC models, and there are 10 more projects that were implemented uh, with other financing or operational models. We have more projects in the pipeline that uh, some of them will be completed in the next couple of weeks. And of course, many more will uh, be completed in the coming months. And also an objective of this project clearly is to have new ESCOs to qualify uh, companies uh, from different sectors to become ESCOs to overcome this chicken and egg problem, no demand, no supply. Uh, we've seen that uh, in this, the level of difficulty differs. In some regions, uh, it was harder uh, to uh, find companies willing to be ESCOs. In other regions, this was the other way around. Now, to give you a glimpse of a few of the projects, I have selected um, six of them, uh, just to give you a feeling what they were like. So the biggest project is the project in Santander in the city. And um, as you can see, with an investment of 11 million, uh, we reduced uh, the installed capacity, uh, was, re was more or less reduced by the factor 50, the annual electricity consumption by uh, uh, to, from 20, uh, 21 million to 4 million a year. And uh, sorry, the kilowatt hours from 21 to 4 million kilowatt hours per year and the annual costs were cut to about a third. So um, what I also would like to stress was that there are also many, many small projects. And that is maybe also one of the findings from our project. Clearly, from a European perspective, it's very, very important to have big projects. Otherwise, we cannot um, get all the investment that is needed going. However, what we will very clearly see there is a distinct market for small EPC projects done by small ESCOs. And here are two examples, one from Sweden, one from Poland. Uh, as you can see, 
tiny project. Uh, nevertheless, uh, you have a similar ratio in the cut of the, uh, or different ratios, but in any case, impressive ratios, uh, cutting, uh, reducing the capacity by a factor of five, for example, in the, in the Swedish project, and again, uh, reducing uh, electricity costs um, by a factor of five, similar to the Polish project. Also, one of the great uh, results of this project was that we also found very, very interesting uh, examples of EPC for indoor lighting. So here are three examples uh, from different regions again. Uh, an internal lighting project in Kilkenny in Ireland, uh, where its bulk capacity was reduced by uh, a factor of two, uh, uh, electricity consumption by a third, by to a third, and similar the costs with an investment of about 170,000. We also wanted to reach out in this project in the internal lighting sector to the private sector. So uh, here are two examples from the private sector. One, um, a gas station in my own region, uh, where for, it's a small gas station. It's not a, a mega big one, not on the motorway, um, but because of the indoor, the outdoor lighting, there are small restaurants, or uh, all the other electricity consumption they have, uh, as you can see, with an investment of 60,000 euros uh, by the ESCO, again, we have half the consumption and also significantly reduced electricity costs. Another example is a production, uh, is a storage company in uh, northern and central Spain, uh, with the similar uh, reductions being implemented. So uh, there are many more examples which can be find, found online in one of our publications that pre presents uh, 28 implemented projects. One of the key things we saw and we found was that EPC can take many different forms. We started by this basic definition that has been used for many years, uh, so there is uh, an owner of, for example, a building or installation with an economic energy savings potential. And here comes an ESCO, and the ESCO um, develops the project, finances the project, implements the project, and operates the project. And this is like the standard definition of EPC. Uh, what we could see in our nine project regions was there are many other solutions. So what is then the core of EPC? So in our projects, we agreed that uh, there are two core aspects that we believe are necessary. Uh, one is that there are contractually guaranteed savings, and there are financial consequences if these savings are not met. So these consequences can take many different forms. So traditionally, it would be reducing uh, the payment to the ESCO, but we also saw uh, cases where, in my region especially, uh, the, uh, the uh, ESCO uh, gave a bank guarantee to the municipality, and in case, gives a bank guarantee to the municipality, and in case the savings are not met, uh, the municipality draws the bank guarantee. We have examples where a percentage of the payment was withheld, uh, until over a couple of years, um, it was clear that the savings are achieved, or in the Swedish project that the ESCO must adjust and replace the equipment until the savings are achieved. So um, other aspects vary greatly. Uh, so we have quite a lot of examples where not the ESCO finances the investment, but the municipality itself. Uh, the reason often is that in some countries, definitely not all countries, but in some of the project countries, um, the, uh, the municipality gets a much cheaper loan than the ESCO from the public sector. Clearly, in, all other, in some other countries, this is the other way around, or the legal situation prevents um, municipalities to take out loans. But again, we saw a variety. Who performs the audit? Who designs the system? Who does the refurbishment work? 
who does the maintenance, how big the project is, whether the whole investment is uh, financed by EPC or only a part, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is one of the very encouraging aspects of this project, is to see the variety of the models. Uh, a few key findings uh, across the nine regions. Uh, we got a lot of interest in EPC. Uh, but we also, as I explained earlier, there is a very low knowledge. So we have to explain, 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 also to overcome some of the typical prejudices that we found in any region. So using the ESCO will increase the project cost due to the ESCO's profit. ESCO solutions threaten local jobs. Uh, so these were the most two typical ones. There are very good answers and very good arguments. Uh, that this is not necessarily the case, but of course you have to be in a position to even start that conversation. Know how and trust are key, so the ESCOs needs knowledge in technical, contractual and financing aspects, and the clients need to understand the model and trust EPC and the ESCO. We learned a lot of things developing the facilitation service that we really have to have a deep knowledge ourselves we had to work closely with individual municipalities, and it's better to take a quality approach, fewer but convincing projects. Good project preparation is key. That is also something that became crystal clear across regions. So uh, we need meaningful inventories of existing system, but not so detailed that the costs become prohibitive. We need good quality audits. Uh, LED offers many choices that you, we didn't have with um, previous technologies, but it also means you have to be much clearer on what you want. It's important to choose quality LEDs. Uh, that also is a message that comes crystal clear out of all the projects. Uh, projects are often prepared by engineers who tend to overestimate the contractual challenges. On the other hand, we see that financing experts do, do tend to underestimate the technical delivery. Of course, procurement issues were an issue uh, in all the regions. Also here, we could see uh, they, they need to be clarified. And often, there is a solution if there is a will. Uh, the equation uh, uh, example, which we will hear later, is, one, is a very good example for that. Uh, we saw great potentials for indoor lighting, uh, depending strongly on the country context, but clearly this is a sector that, we, uh, uh, that um, is good to look into further into the future. And as, we, as I said earlier, facilitation works. And with that, I would like to end my short presentation, invite you uh, to our uh, conference, the World Sustainable Energy Days, uh, in less than a month. And there, we also hold the European Energy Efficiency Services Conference, where we'll prevent, present many more insights into how to develop markets uh, for energy efficiency services. And with that, I thank you for your attention and give back to Philippe. Thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting presentation. So you can see that much has been achieved. Many challenges were overcome. And we already have some questions that were asked during your presentations, so uh, I'll go through them. So Mr. Ungerbock um, asked regarding the quick checks, what are the concrete outcomes of it? Benchmarks, go or no go, basics for tendering, could you maybe elaborate on that? Yeah, the quick checks are a very rough document that asks questions like, is the installation older than 10 years or not? Uh, so four or five questions in most cases. Is the other has already uh, a refurbishment been done in the past couple of months? Uh, so very, very basic things, just to weed out those projects where it's really not worth to spend the time on looking uh, at that further. Uh, we found that this is it's a systematics we have developed for other projects, so it doesn't give you any benchmarks here. 
It just gives you an indication, is it worthwhile to continue this conversation or not? We also have, for example, in some regions, a benchmark of the electricity price. So if the electricity price is below a certain level, it's going to be very difficult to finance, to uh, have an economic savings potential. Uh, the uh, quick checks are online on our website uh, that you can see on the slides, uh, www.streetlight-epc.eu. And as I said, the quick checks are available in 10 European languages. You have a follow-up question on your on your answer. Um, what do you mean by the financial experts often underestimate the technical side? Yeah. <laughs> so I wasn't that. clear that this would, this would uh, provoke some questions. Um, well, uh, I've, I we've seen that there are in the project preparation. There are technical issues that need to be addressed, uh, and that the the, the calculation uh, of the savings, the technical delivery, it's not rocket science. It's not rocket science. That would be a very wrong message to give. But we have seen uh, in some of the regions, especially where there was quite an interest from banks, from financial to um, to finance, and to think. Uh, an ESCO is just someone uh, who provides the money. And uh, in our definition, uh, this is not the case, but the, uh, the ESCO uh, has uh, the technical know-how uh, and the contractual know-how to develop the project and is able to acquire or uh, to assure the financing of the project. That can be from a bank, that can be uh, from, as I said, from the owner, of the installation that can, can come from European funding. So we had a variety of funding sources for our project, but it is important, especially in the early phase of the project, uh, to really go into the technical detail. Otherwise, there is a risk that the project will fail. Uh, the next question was, what's the reason behind 80% of street lighting being phased out? Uh, I think this is a good question for Timothy Noel. Uh, this, uh, but I will answer it quickly. Uh, the reason is similar to incandescent light bulbs in the indoor lighting. Um, an agreement has been reached uh, among the European member states that uh, certain technologies uh, must disappear from the market uh, because they are simply too inefficient. And so a decision was taken, as you all know, uh, a couple of years ago to phase out incandescent light bulbs uh, and some other technologies uh, from the indoor lighting market. And the same applies to street lighting. There are many technologies in place that are simply too inefficient. So phasing out means not that you have to take them out, but it means that if those that are in place don't work anymore, you cannot buy new ones. And different from household lighting, uh, for street lighting, uh, that usually also means that the whole luminaire needs to be replaced. So the investment needed is often bigger. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Timothy Noel, would you have something to add to this answer? Uh, maybe we can continue to the next uh, to the next uh, question. Um, so, what are the performance targets used in this EPC contract percentage in energy saving in kilowatts hour? Yes, uh, it depends. Again, uh, that is the good thing about about EPC that uh, you have a contract, and in the contract, um, the ESCO and the client can agree. Uh, on many things. Uh, so that's why it's, I always, um, we always advise to be cautious with model contracts uh, because then sometimes there's the risk that people don't really understand what they commit themselves to. And um, if you think that doesn't happen, uh, maybe uh, it's worthwhile to go out and check. So, uh, uh, what uh, it depends 
usually it's uh, a combination of both uh, a, a savings in terms of kilowatt hours or megawatt hours. Uh, in some uh, we, in some contexts, there's also uh, in addition to that uh, a savings target in terms of money. Thank you. Thank you for the, that answer. Uh, one other question was regarding the ESCOs we you work with. Uh, are these ESCOs also interested to other issues than lighting projects? Do they have expertise on energy efficiency buildings, for example, in buildings? Absolutely. This was one of this is one of the targets of this project. I uh, forgot to mention it. Clearly, uh, the street lighting market. We see this as I said at the beginning, as a learning and testing round for other more complex forms of EPC. So what we can see in this project, there are some ESCOs that will remain small companies maybe, that remain happy uh, to do small EPC projects uh, in, their in their respective regions on streetlight only. But uh, we also see ESCOs that in the course of this project start out with a street light project and then qualify themselves towards, uh, for example, the building sector or the industrial sector. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for your answers. I don't see any more questions being asked. We. Um, Mm. Ah, one one more question. Where would you set the minimum size of an EPC street lighting project? <laughs> Good question. Good question. Um, so here in our region, for our funding program that we run for the regional government that supports the financing instruments, we have an investment threshold of fifty thousand euro. Uh, why is that the case? Because of the transaction costs, so the preparation of such a contract um, costs money, and that has to be earned in the course of the project. So here in our specific context, we found that this uh, is a workable threshold, um, and uh, as you could see on my slide, there are some very small projects as well. This may be different in different other countries, especially if the legal framework requests uh, a very complex procedure, then probably the investment thresholds must be bigger, because otherwise, again, the ESCO cannot earn back the money uh, that needed for preparing the project. Thank you. One last question was asked by um, uh, by Johan Kuhlen from Factor 4 in Belgium and the Netherlands. So one of the barriers, at least here in Belgium, is that the market is closed. Municipalities organize the street lighting together with utilities, electricity distribution companies that have good political contacts with municipalities. How do you deal with that? <laughs> that is a very difficult question. Um, I don't have an answer, frankly, to that, um, a normal answer. I mean, what, what you could try to do is start with a pilot municipality. There are always, what we find, there are always some early adopters that are willing uh, to go towards innovation. And then if some of the municip other municipalities see, wow, this actually works, then two things can happen. Uh, one is that the existing companies that do the maintenance become interested and also start offering EPC services, or that maybe some of the existing um, informal structures uh, start breaking up and there is an opening for, um, uh, for new market entrants. Clearly, uh, this is an issue in some countries more than in others. Uh, however, I think uh, what we can see here with the examples of these projects, I mean, it's so it's such a convincing business case. Uh, EPC for street lighting in most European countries is really does make economic sense. So I think uh, 
clearly, as I said earlier, the challenges differ from country to country, but I think we can make this business case so evident and clear to municipalities it might be possible to find some early adopters. Thank you very much for your uh, f for your answers. If uh, other questions are to be asked, they could be asked maybe at the end of the webinar if we have more time. Otherwise, we will provide uh, to all the participants, of course, the, the contacts of the speakers. So let's proceed to our next presentation from uh, Mr. Timothy Noel from the European Commission. I'll just upload the slides and we can um, Okay, the slides are ready. Monsieur Timothy Noel, you can unmute your microphone and start sharing the webcam as well. Perfect. Okay, good morning to all of you. I'm, I'm very pleased to be there. Um, I would like to thank the organizer for the invitation and also uh, thanks Fidaren for welcoming me uh, in their office in Brussels. Um, and I'm also very pleased to be there because I've been following that specific project since its beginning, uh, since uh, more than three years. And I'm very pleased now to see the results um, of this specific project uh, funded uh, by also EU funds. What I would like to um, give you as a presentation today is to respond to the question how the clean energy for all European package, which was released uh, in November uh, last year, two months ago, can somehow support uh, the development of the energy performance contracting uh, market. And I think, next slide. I guess you see the next slide. Perhaps not, just. Uh, in order to which one? Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so, in order to answer that, that question, basically, so how can these new proposed measures can foster the development of the market? We should ask ourselves the question. I mean, are they going to somehow have an impact on the specific barriers that are currently hampering the development of that market? And it has been mentioned by Christiane uh, in her presentation, but I would like to mention them again quickly. Those barriers are multiple, and that's why at the moment we have a market which is very heterogeneous in Europe, where in some countries the market is somehow happening and, and improving, but which is in some other member states very slowly progressing. Those barriers are typically a lack of information, lack of awareness of this type of business model, sometimes some institutional or legislative issues related, for instance, to uh, public procurement, we also have an issue with financing. Um, so uh, sometimes for the ESCOs, a problem of access to financing or a problem of free financing. We also have uh, the questions of the accounting treatment for energy performance contracting in the public sectors in some member states. Sometimes we have also externalities like cost of energy, which has directly an impact on the business models. Uh, in terms of technicalities and administrative issues, you also have, for instance, the uh, transaction cost that can be an issue. And, and for me, one of the, the, the biggest barriers is the behavior of um, potential customers. They are still not yet fully convinced or they perhaps do not yet fully understand what is proposed behind an EPC. And so there is still many people skeptical or that have difficulties to understand the basics behind EPC. So. Uh, that's the question we should ask ourselves. I mean, do the current, uh, the, the proposed measures answer those different barriers? But I would like to be uh, also positive because I, I don't like to only speak about barriers when we are speaking about energy performance contracting because I think because there is lack of understanding, we should always remind the benefits of energy performance contract. And so I would like to uh, remind that an energy performance contract could, uh, in fact, be a good solution in some cases to respond to the new environment that will be created by those new users because it offers to end users a turnkey project 
where you have an ISCO that take, in, takes in charge the whole uh, projects that guarantee a performance in terms of energy savings or financial performance, that take the risk, um, that also establish a good relationship with the supplier and where the savings from the investment then are used to directly pay um, to, to pay the, the, the upfront capital and the, the initial investment. So it's always good also to keep uh, to see EPC as an opportunity and not only as a series of different barriers. Now, before um, giving you some information about the uh, proposed new uh, measures from the package. I think it's important to remind all of you that, uh, in fact, in the current uh, legislation framework that we have in Europe, we already have a lot to support the development of the market. So we've got the Energy Efficiency Directive um, from 2012 that have specific article on the promotion of energy services and energy performance contracting. In that specific directive, you have an article, uh, which is perhaps not so well known, which is Article 18, where member states shall uh, undertake a number of different measures in order to promote the development of the market, such as developing model contracts for the public sectors, having a list of energy services provider, developing quality, labels, uh, points of contact, supporting facilitation, and so on. That's a very important article, Article 18. We also have different articles like Article 5, which oblige the member state to refurbish a certain percentage of their public buildings owned um, or used and used by uh, central governments. And it is clearly indicated that energy performance contract could be a way to uh, uh, implement those uh, refurbishments. We also have Article 7, which is the article um, that basically uh, establish energy saving uh, uh, obligation schemes in member states uh, or alternatives. And we know that this article is very important to create a demand for energy savings in the market. And obviously, ESCOs and energy performance contracts could answer that demand. Uh, article 19 is also an interesting one because it ask the member states to look at the non-regulatory barriers that could be related to public purchasing or annual budgeting or accounting treatment. Um, and Article 8 that basically asks the companies uh, to have uh, regular energy audit is also uh, a good starting point to start uh, uh, an EPC. So all these articles are very relevant in general for the market and they are still there. And uh, except for Article 7, they are not basically touched or modified by the proposed measures. So they are absolutely key. And uh, when we are asking ourselves the question what, how the, the EU legislation could support the market, then let's first focus, I think, on this uh, specific uh, article. I also would like to remind very quickly that we are also at the EU level supporting the development of the energy performance, performance contracting market uh, by a series of other uh, accompanying uh, measures. Um, the, the, the GRC um, uh, from the European Commission is regularly working on the topic, is uh, regularly publishing reports on the state of play of the market. A new report is going to uh, be published uh, very soon. We also have uh, different calls for proposals supported under Horizon 2020 uh, that promote specific uh, projects on innovative financing schemes that could be related to energy performance contracts. Uh, we have specific project development assistance facilities such as ELENA that are also key to support the, uh, the development of the project. And of course, we've got structural funds with 17 billion euro uh, dedicated to energy efficiency in the current programming period. It's, it's three times more than what we used to have in the past period. Um, the Junker plan uh, with the European Fund for Strategic Investment and, and dedicated also other financing instruments such as the European Energy Efficiency Fund that could be uh, used to provide financing to EPC uh, projects in the public sector. Um, but let's uh, go back to the first question um, which was uh, asked. So how the clean uh, energy package uh, could basically support the development of that market? 
So first, I would like to give you a few words um, to in introduce you to the um, to the large and extensive energy package that was launched uh, in November. With this package, we want the EU to lead the energy transition uh, and not only to adapt to it. Our proposals have three main goals. The first goal is to put energy efficiency first, because we know energy efficiency is the most available type of source of energy, and we need to consider it as a dedicated source of energy. It's also the cleanest and uh, the cheapest. We also, uh, our second objective is to demonstrate that EU can take the, um, could be the global leader uh, in the area of renewable. And finally, uh, we want to focus on consumers and we want to deliver to them a fair deal uh, when we're speaking about uh, energy. The uh, idea uh, and the driving force behind this package is, of course, to um, create jobs uh, and growth uh, in the European Union. Um, this package has the potential to deliver up to uh, 900,000 additional jobs and 190 billion of GDP gains by 2030. So it will and should have an impact on our economy. It should also, of course, uh, support uh, the EU achieve its ambitious objectives in terms of uh, climate uh, challenges and support also the EU in terms, of in, in terms of the question of energy security. Then if uh, we look at what is proposed more specifically in terms of um, energy um, efficiency, the package touches upon three specific uh, energy efficiency legislations. First, we are suggesting, proposing to the Parliament and Council to um, amend the Directive on Energy uh, Efficiency Directive in order to set the right framework for improving energy efficiency uh, in general. So that's related uh, to the overall target that we want to achieve by 2030. We are also planning to uh, have a new working plan as regard the eco-design uh, directive to improve energy performance of products and better inform consumers. And uh, we are focusing on buildings, uh, of course. Um, and so we are also proposing um, to amend the energy performance of uh, building uh, directive, so to improve energy efficiency in buildings. And in addition to that, we are um, launching uh, specific initiatives on financing uh, in order to further mobilize private investment uh, in the area of energy efficiency and uh, renewable energy sources uh, in buildings. But I will come back to that um, by giving you some more uh, information. So uh, in practical terms, how these uh, proposals will have an effect on the EPC market. I think clearly um, the proposed target for 2030, so a binding 30% energy efficiency target at the EU level by 2030, compared to uh, a baseline defined in 2007, will have a clear impact on the market because it will give this long-term vision that investors want. So it will create a favorable investment uh, framework and favorable investment conditions in the market. And that will automatically uh, lead to more demand for energy efficiency projects and automatically leads then to uh, more demand for uh, energy performance contracting. In the EED uh, proposals, we also want to extend Article 7 which was not initially supposed to go beyond 2020. We want to extend that to continue uh, that specific article, to continue having energy efficiency obligation schemes and also alternative measures, because this article is key to create dynamism in the market and to really trigger the savings that we need to achieve uh, in order to um, achieve our overall uh, EU energy and climate target. So, our proposal is to continue that article, and we expect that half of the savings that we need to achieve will come from that specific article. And as you might already know, um, third uh, party or energy service providers have a key role to play uh, in order to help the obligated parties in, in such obligate, uh, obligation schemes to 
basically obtain uh, sufficient energy savings. So that's, I think, two important measures that will have a clear impact uh, on the market in the, uh, in the years uh, to come. The important also aspect of that package is that we're focusing on buildings. And rightly, um, because we know that 40% of the energy consumption in the EU is uh, consuming buildings, we also know that 75% of our housing stock is energy inefficient because it was mostly built when we didn't have minimum energy performance uh, requirements. We also know that uh, this would not be a problem if there was, if many buildings were refurbishing uh, each year, but we know that that's not happening uh, at the moment because we have very low renovation uh, rates. So we need to accelerate that. We need to accelerate uh, investment in building renovation. And uh, this also um, package uh, puts an emphasis on the importance of smart technologies. And I think uh, that's also something that could have uh, 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 an indirect impact on the EPC market. And it's also consider the building not as a single element, but as part of being, as part of the, the overall energy system. So there is also a link between the building sector and uh, the electrification of the transport sector. Just to, um, so just a few information about what we are proposing on the uh, energy performance of building directive. We want to make that directive uh, simpler, uh, smarter, and also more supportive. Uh, when we're saying, um, for instance, uh, more supportive, we are also asking the member states uh, to develop and to define uh, clear renovation plan to decarbonize their building sector on the long term, so within horizon 2050. And we also ask them, or we propose to ask them, to uh, also think about the financing strategy uh, behind these renovation plans. And also that that's where um, EPC, energy performance contracting, could also uh, play uh, a role. On the smart uh, aspect, um, our proposal also encourage the use of ICT and smart technologies. Um, we are promoting so the use of building automation control system as an alternative to physical inspections. Uh, we are also encouraging the rollout of the rollout of infrastructure for e-mobility, so in uh, large commercial buildings. And we are also willing to introduce a smart uh, NES uh, indicators uh, to also foster the development uh, of building automation and smart uh, buildings in Europe. And we know that very often, in fact, EPC and uh, ESCOs have already that knowledge. And I think that by highlighting uh, the importance and the opportunities related to smartness in buildings, this could also be uh, a way uh, for the ESCOs and the EPC uh, to better position themselves uh, on the market. Um, now I would like to say a few words about um, the specific financing initiative that we are um, also proposing in uh, our package, which is called the Smart Finance for Smart Buildings Initiative. The main goal of that initiative is pretty simple, is to uh, make sure that we trigger and that we mobilize sufficient private uh, financing in order to uh, invest, in order to uh, finance all the investment that we will need to do in the next uh, 13 coming years uh, in the area of uh, energy uh, efficiency. This, this initiative uh, is structured around three uh, specific pillars. The first pillar and the first idea of this um, initiative is to uh, use more effectively public funds. So what we are saying is that uh, when um, there is no market issues, when there is a business case, then public funds should not be used as subsidies, but public funds should be used in the form of financial instruments in order to mobilize more private uh, financing. And financial instruments could typically be in the form of concessional loans, could be in the form of guarantee or equity, and it could also be, for instance, uh, forfeiting funds uh, to buy future receivables uh, from uh, ESCO contracts. So to also um, boost and, and promote uh, EPC in the different member states. 
the idea is also to uh, support the development of flexible uh, financing platforms at the national level and uh, especially with the objective to um, combine all possible existing uh, funds, including uh, European funds, so funds coming from the structural um, uh, funds, and also uh, debt uh, coming from uh, the European Fund for Strategic uh, Investment. So that, that's the, um, the, the first uh, pillar of the initiative. The second uh, pillar, and perhaps I will go directly through the, the, the next slides. Oh. The second pillar is about uh, assistance and aggregation, so to basically uh, support the development of uh, uh, an investable project pipeline uh, in Europe. And then the last part is about uh, de-risking. De-risking means uh, to uh, convince, to change the risk perception of financiers uh, investors and also project developers behind energy efficiency investment. We want them uh, to fully understand the real risk uh, and benefits of energy efficiency projects. So just to uh, give you some more inside information uh, about this initiative, under our first pillar, um, one of our goal is also to favor public investment in energy efficiency and uh, on that aspect we are addressing and we want to address the question of uh, accounting treatment for energy performance contract in the public sector. That's why the, the communication uh, specifies that uh, the European Commission is so currently um, and has in fact already uh, set up a task force to work on that issue. We're working on, with Eurostat and also we are consulting member states on that question. Uh, to see what are the different options to eventually uh, modify the Eurostat guidance from 2015 uh, as appropriate. Um, and, and this is really uh, work in progress uh, at the moment. So as part of the second pillar on aggregation and assistance, we want to reinforce existing EU project development assistance, such as ELENA, such as uh, the, the support provided by the PDA uh, ESME uh, schemes. Um, we have the experience of ELENA and ELENA has demonstrated that uh, in order to trigger ambitious and lighthouse projects in the field of energy performance contracting, this type of support was very helpful. So the idea of uh, PDA uh, schemes is to support project developers by uh, helping them with all the missing skills they have in-house so in order to further develop their projects. So it's a mechanism that allow project de developers to receive funds to, to basically have access to the right technical skills, to the right financial skills or legal skills in order at the end of the day to have investable and aggregated projects. We also want to, um, under that second pillar, aggregation and assistance, to encourage the development of local and regional one-stop shop at so yeah, the local and regional level. The idea behind that is to uh, foster the development of uh, services that encompass the whole project cycle, so that basically uh, support project developers throughout the whole um, throughout the whole journey. So from the audit phase, from, um, from the definition of a technical offer that should come together with the financial offer through uh, the um, support uh, of selecting the right, um, the, the right companies to do the, to do the job, to supervise the job and then to check the, uh, the energy performance uh, of, the, um, of the project. So this will certainly also uh, boost energy services um, in uh, Europe. And finally, the last uh, pillar of the uh, Smart Finance for Smart Buildings initiative is about de-risking. So uh, I've briefly explained to you what de-risking means. Um, but at the end of the day, what we want to do with that uh, specific um, action is to have a structural change uh, in the market. We want to change the way banks and investors understand and seize energy efficiency and we want to convince them that energy efficiency investment is also a win-win situation for them because it provides more reliable cash flows with less uh, payment defaults 
because when they invest into an asset, into a building which is more energy efficient, you should have a green value or brown discount, depending as you see. So it should also be less risk for them if suddenly they have to sell the um, the, the, the mortgage and the, um, the the building on the market. So there is a risk reduction. Uh, and it will also bring for them refinancing opportunities because we know that investors are uh, big uh, institutional investors are willing to place their money uh, in a more sustainable type of investment. And if we achieve to develop a portfolio of energy efficiency loans, then this will create an important and a very interesting refinancing uh, opportunities for uh, investors. So in order to, to, to achieve that goal, <clears throat> we are uh, basically working together with EFIG, which is the Energy Efficiency Financial Institution uh, Group. Um, and we have, uh, together with the group, so um, develop and working on two specific actions. The first one is to develop uh, the Deep Platform, which is an open source database that disclose real performance data of real investment projects. So the idea um, is to know, uh, and we have already uh, more than 7,800 projects in that database, which is freely accessible. So uh, real performance of how much did it cost, what was done in terms of the energy efficient action, uh, what has been achieved in terms of financing performance. And this is important, basically, to uh, provide a tool for project developers, for financiers, and also for uh, investors to do benchmarking of their uh, investment projects, uh, to also better understand the risk behind uh, these uh, investments, to understand the payback period, uh, and so on. So that's, for us, a key tool that needs to be further developed and um, I would like to take that opportunity to also uh, uh, ask you that if you have data available that could be then um, used in that specific database that you can contact me uh, or the, 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 the contractors behind uh, the deep platform uh, to then help us uh, develop uh, better this platform. Then the second specific uh, actions that we are performing with EFIC to change this uh, structure of the market or perception of, of risk is to work uh, with um, banks, with investors, with project developers about a consensual, uh, a commonly agreed underwriting uh, framework. So it's basically a guide that will help uh, the banks, that will help investors better understand how they have to assess the risk and the benefits of energy efficiency. That's very much needed. Um, and there is also a, a, a need to collect good practices in Europe and to share that among all the market participants. As I've said, the platform is available uh, online, so I will I invite you to, to um, visit it. And um, that's it from my side. I think I've already been too long. <laughs> Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much for your uh, your presentation and uh, especially for your guiding through this new clean energy package. Um, several questions were asked. I'm, I would like to just to, to specify to our participants that Mr. Noel will be taking all the questions now. Okay, so if you do have questions, uh, don't hesitate to write them right now. Okay. So there were a few questions to which you already answered uh, uh, with your 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 uh, other um, during the presentation later on, but I'll still ask them. So there was one question regarding the Eurostep note: Should the investments through an ESCO for the municipality be recognized as public debt? I'm not sure if you want to add any questions. Um, that's. That's exactly uh, the purpose of uh, of the task force. Uh, the Eurostat guidance note published in 2015 provided or provides a clear indication uh, on that uh, question. And uh, the objective of the task force is to uh, understand the impact of that note, uh, of that guidance note. Uh, and to see whether there are different options uh, that could create more flexibilities. But um, it's really work uh, in progress, under progress. 
with Eurostat uh, and also with representatives from the member states from their uh, statistical office. Thank you. Uh, so one more question again, which was was tackled during your presentation. Um, European municipalities have bad uh, experience in the past with public-private uh, partnerships in ver various sectors. What regulation framework for ESCO EDC market could avoid this risk for municipalities? I'm not sure I've fully understood which risk, in fact, um, the the person was referring to. Indeed, maybe she will give us a bit more details in the chat box, so to, to clarify the question, so we can go. Because if it's uh, the risk on. of yeah, if it's the risk of uh, then having the uh, investment undertaken by the ESCOs on balance sheets, then that's exactly, again, the questions, the answer I provided uh, beforehand, and, and that's currently being uh, looked at carefully. But if it's about the performance risk, normally an ESCO should guarantee the performance risk, so the, in terms of performance risk, they should not be uh, the risk. Um, and then on the overall uh, business model and uh, on, on the, the uh, attractiveness of the project for the municipality, I think that's a case-to-case -case, uh, decision. Great. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, we have one more question, which is also partly an idea. Uh, would it be possible uh, in the framework of the Eurostat uh, uh, to consider outsourced street lighting equipment as public-private project owned for uh, more than 50% by the ESCO, so realize off-balance sheet financing, or would that not be allowed? I think that when we are speaking about these uh, questions of uh, on of balance sheets, um, we should all realize that, uh, in fact, everything is currently, I mean, we have already clear rules in ESA 2010 uh, as regards the classification of, uh, of uh, debt. And so if you take the option of a, a PPP, then you have clearly defined a very specific rule that applies not to e only to EPC, but if you want to build a bridge using in the form of PPP, then you will have to respect the same rules. Uh, and there are many different criteria to look at. The, the rule of 50% uh, is one of them, and, and we know that this is one of the issues uh, uh, that is uh, mentioned by stakeholders uh, as regard the classification of debt for EPC. But you also have the question of risk and rewards. I mean, who is owning the risk, who is taking the risk, and who is also um, getting the reward. Um, so I don't think it's, it's easy to, to uh, reply to such a question without entering into all the very nitty-gritty uh, of, uh, of the ESI 2010 uh, rules. And again, that, that's exactly uh, why we have uh, statisticians uh, from all over Europe working on that question uh, right now. Okay, uh, there was one more question again, which uh, on which you, you gave elements of answer uh, in your presentation. Would the European Commission consider the establishment of an EU organization that would get all the funding instead of member states, institutions, and individual projects in Horizon 2020? And the experience could be gathered in one place, and access could be uh, direct, so with results and assessments. Um, I mean, in terms of the management of EU funds, the bulk part of the EU funds uh, are under the, the structural funds, and the structural funds are uh, not managed uh, centrally uh, um, by the Commission, but they are uh, managed by managing authorities in each country, in each region. 
Uh, and that's, again, the bulk part of the money. It represents, like I've said, 17 billion euro uh, over the, the current programming period. And uh, there is no, I think, willing, willingness to to change that uh, that aspect. So, the managing authorities that basically are in charge of defining operational programs to best use these uh, structural funds uh, have indeed a key role in um, in supporting uh, also the energy efficiency market. I'm not sure I was uh, answering exactly the question, but question was not so clear to me. Indeed, indeed. Um, well, maybe if uh, the question wasn't answered, uh, the person who will, will specify the, the, the question. We can go on to the next uh, question. Don't hesitate to ask your questions regarding the clean energy package. This is, the, this is a good opportunity for you to, to receive some guidance. Um, so the main problem of EPC, non-EPC projects, normally don't deliver the expected savings. Studies mention only 60% savings are delivered on average. This is hardly, hardly taken into account in upfront scenarios. Therefore, the savings guarantee is always underrated. Do you see a way to solve this problem? I think that I mean that that's why we uh, we have, for instance, uh, the D platform uh, is to have a better uh, understanding of uh, the real risk. Um, the information we have in the D platform are uh, more positive than than what is uh, said by the person who asked the question. We have, uh, in fact, quite. Uh, a, a good level of uh, also performance in, in terms of real savings achieved. Nevertheless, the deep platform uh, just represents the uh, results of 7,000 projects. It's a lot, but it's not all projects implemented in Europe. So um, it's just representative of a, of a group of, uh, of projects. But uh, th th that's why we we need to um, to provide more information into that the platforms and and understand exactly uh, what is the uh, the, the risk uh, at stakes. But that that's uh, also the added value of indeed of energy performance contracting uh, on the market, and that's that the key selling point for UNESCO uh, is the uh, their expertise to define uh, specific technical solutions that fits exactly the needs uh, of a building or an industry, uh, but also to be able uh, to master all the process and to uh, propose uh, a clear, uh, a clear um, performance guarantee. Uh, and that's why also there is an extra cost for that. So, um, and that's also why we have, for instance, uh, in the EED uh, directive, specific uh, articles that promote the development of the market. So I think the, the, the answer to that question is, is uh, one, we need to uh, continue better un understanding what are the real performance of energy efficiency investment. And that's typically what we're doing in DEEP. And second is to uh, foster and promote uh, all type of business models that actually deliver guaranteed uh, savings. And uh, energy performance contracting is is uh, is one of these models. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one. So we'll be taking the final questions now. Um, do you have any idea when the Eurostat barrier will be removed, reduced? Another tricky question. Is this a question of months or maybe years? Um, so again, what is currently uh, taking place is an analysis. Um, different options are being considered. Uh, the idea is not to remove the, the, the guidance, uh, but eventually adapt it uh, if uh, appropriate. Uh, and uh, this will be a question uh, of uh, of months to have at least the results of the of the task force, and then this will be, if relevant, uh, this will have an impact on on the uh, on the guidance notes. But but there is a clear wish from the Commission side, uh, of course, to take this. Uh, um, 
problem, this question very seriously, and um, so we're working on it. Thank you. Thank you very much for your answers. I um, think that this uh, wraps up the Q&A questions for Mr. Uh, Noel. Thank you very much for your contribution today, for coming. I know that you cannot okay. stay uh, longer with us until the end of the webinar. Um, so thank you, and I'm sure that all participants, thank you. if they have more questions, they can uh, they direct them directly to, to, to you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. We can now proceed to our uh, final, uh, final and concluding uh, presentation um, from uh, Mr. Valimir Segon. Um, I'll just upload the um, the slide, and we can proceed. Valimir, can you hear us? You have the floor. Yes. And you can share your webcam Thank you. as well. Start the webcam and share it. I have. The, can you see me? Is it working? Not yet. No. Not yet. Not Just the a moment. Ready. Perfect. Now we can. Okay. Start. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So hello, everyone. Uh, on behalf of uh, Northwest Croatia Regional Energy Agency. Uh, well, thank you to, to, to Federan and to Christian for, for organizing this and for the opportunity to, to speak and uh, to, to present our experiences. So we are a partner in, in the Streetlight EPC project and uh, we have done some, uh, some activities and pilot projects and uh, are trying hard to, to remove market barriers in, in, in Croatia. Uh, just a quick uh, uh, overview of uh, our agency. We were founded in 2008 by four regional authorities in Croatia, uh, three counties and the city of Zagreb being the capital and having a county-like status. We have at the moment 29 employees. We are currently hiring more, so we'll have over 30 quite soon. This is part of our team, uh, and this is our new offices at the Energy Center Bracak. We are quite uh, proud of that. It's an old castle, actually, which was reconstructed, and it's, it's our uh, energy center now. A lot of uh, 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 pilot uh, uh, energy efficiency measures and uh, uh, renewable equipment installed there. Uh, we are quite active in implementing uh, uh, specific projects on reconstruction of buildings, uh, installment of renewable energy sources, but also in street lighting uh, uh, projects. The ESCO market in, in Croatia today, uh, well, you have heard the, 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 this project is based on the fact that in most EU countries, uh, ESCO market is undeveloped. This is the case for Croatia as well. So some of the barriers uh, are similar to other countries. There is a low level of uh, confidence, uh, limited financial technical capacity of cities, municipalities to invest, to, to take the, the debt. Uh, they have no equity. We have quite low electricity prices in, in Croatia. They, they uh, uh, vary somewhat. It's different price for uh, street lighting. Currently, this is on the range of uh, uh, 11 euro cents per uh, per kilowatt hour. So, uh, without VAT, it's it's quite low price, and it's currently uh, perhaps the major obstacle to implement more EPC projects. Uh, within Streetlight EPC, we have uh, nevertheless implemented uh, several pilot uh, uh, EPC projects in street lighting, in indoor lighting as well, and uh, we have uh, uh, implemented them using uh, a variety of uh, models. Uh, of course, you always have to, to, to listen and to, to, to do what uh, ultimately the client is saying, the cities and municipalities, so you have to, to have a sort of a tailor-made approach. Uh, however, the three main categories which we, we uh, can classify our projects are uh, design and build mode uh, with some EPC uh, uh, features, uh, classic energy performance contracting projects, and uh, PPP uh, projects. And we have examples for, for each of them. You will see them later. Uh, so, not to repeat what Christiane uh, said in her presentation, uh, uh, but uh, this is the common ESCO de denominator. So, the minimum requirement for, of all uh, these projects is to have contractually guaranteed savings 
and financial consequences if the, the guarantees are, are not met. This is really the basic uh, of, of all projects. Without that, it's simply not an EPC project. Uh, quickly, the, the features, the, the advantages and disadvantages of, uh, of each of the three uh, uh, models. So design and build, it's the simplest one, it's the easiest to tender, the, the shortest, the, the less complex uh, procurement process. It could be the, the cheapest if the, the public authorities can get the cheapest uh, financing uh, costs. Uh, and, uh, well, it has to have some EPC features, uh, of course, to, to be an EPC project. The, the classic, uh, typical EPC project in Croatia, we have uh, uh, an ordinance issued by the government which defines the minimum requirement of EPC contracts. Uh, EPC projects are recognized within energy efficiency law, so legislation framework is, is in place. So uh, the focus is on energy efficiency measures, not on the whole service as in PPP projects, provides a stronger guarantee than uh, the design and build projects, and incorporates uh, uh, project risk in, in relation to uh, energy efficiency measures. Uh, PPP projects, well, are the most complex, the most uh, uh, demanding in terms of uh, preparation of documentation. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, costs of this preparation, uh, their advantage is that uh, 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 if uh, uh, it's a fully approved PPC, PPP project, and we have a special law on PPP in Croatia, sub laws, very much defined the legislation on that again. Uh, if it's a fully PPP project, then it's not taken as, as a, a public debt, uh, uh, and uh, it's it's somehow solves the, 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 the Eurostat uh, uh, regulation. So PPP ensures clear uh, risk allocation methodology and uh, it's this, this is one of the key issues really for, for PPP. Quite a, a, a lot of risks have to be allocated uh, very clearly in the, in the contract, uh, very, very complex risk allocation procedure. To get on the implemented projects, uh, the first one was reconstruction of indoor lighting in uh, three schools uh, in uh, Krapina Zagori County, which is one of our founders. Uh, it was a combination, actually, between it was between a design and build project and an EPC project. Uh, we uh, the, the county actually managed to to get a considerable amount of subsidy from the National Environment Fund. It was 80% of subsidy, as you can see, divestment and, and the subsidy, so quite, quite a big amount. In order to get this subsidy, we, we had to, uh, well, juggle a little bit. To, so the, the, the fund call for tenders was for typical design and build projects, and uh, we wanted to implement some EPC in it, so we have uh, uh, prepared documentation for the fund to get the subsidy, which was based on the uh, uh, a typical build project. However, the, the final contract signed with the company uh, does include elements of EPC, so the savings are defined, uh, measurement procedures are defined, and penalties for not achieving the savings are also defined and included in, in the contract. You can see some information here regarding cost savings, uh, reduction of electricity consumption, CO2 reduction. So it's a relatively small project, but it's, it's a pilot project. But it, it was quite a good results in, in the end. Uh, some more technical details. So uh, uh, before renovation and after in renovation, so considerable uh, uh, savings in terms of uh, uh, installed capacity, which uh, then correspond to, to uh, electricity savings. Uh, the total number of lamps uh, before and after, so uh, you can see all the relevant information here. And some photos of, of this project. This is a, a sport uh, hall in one of the three schools, so before and after the, the reconstruction. It looks nicer in, in, uh, if, you, if you see it in person, but still, even in the photo, I think it's, it's quite obvious that uh, the, the illumination is, is better. Uh, the second project, which is uh, which was a, a typical EPC project, followed the, the legislation, the ordinance uh, on a, a EPC contract. Uh, it was a street lighting project in the uh, Croatian city of uh, Verbovets. 
Uh, that was the bigger project, as you can see, from the capital costs. Uh, the overall contract value was uh, was uh, bigger, of course, than the, only the capital cost because it includes uh, uh, ESCO uh, uh, other costs, not only the, the capital ones. And you can again see some uh, considerable electricity savings per year. Uh, there were savings on maintenance costs, uh, reduction of electricity consumption, CO2 as, as well. This project did not receive uh, actually subsidies, but because the current status of uh, uh, street lighting was quite in a poor condition, it was possible to achieve considerable savings and good payback periods even without it. But this was mostly uh, 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 an exemption. It's not a, a common uh, situation. So again, some technical details on the project. Uh, as you can see, the, ins the, the decrease in installed power was almost five times uh, after the, the renovation. Very, very big savings uh, of uh, uh, almost 80%. Uh, and the, the illuminance was, was even better. So uh, in the contract it is uh, stated that uh, illumination is measured as well, so standards of illumination have to be satisfied, not only energy savings, but of course the, the lighting has to be appropriate. And you can see, see uh, here uh, photos of the city of Verbovets and uh, the new, uh, uh, some of the new lighting uh, uh, which was installed. And the last uh, project which I would like to show you was a, a full PPP project. It's uh, implemented in the mun municipality of Kostrena. Uh, the project uh, uh, volume was not a big one, so this is not a typical PPP project where you, you want to have big volumes because the preparation costs were quite uh, high. But this is the first PPP project in Croatia for street lighting. So it was uh, a pilot project and uh, it's again a sort of a, a, an exception. But it serves as, as a basis for, for, for application. So the whole PPP documentation was prepared. Uh, the, the overall procedure was followed, so uh, we have a special uh, a national agency for PPP which have to approve these projects. The uh, Ministry of Finance gives the final approval, uh, quite, quite lengthy and, and complicated procedure. But uh, uh, we, we managed to, to, to do it, actually. We, we helped the municipality to do it. Uh, you can see here technical data, so again, quite uh, considerable energy savings, uh, better illuminating standard, uh, but of course more risks were defined and, and categorized and more uh, uh, services and standards were defined in, in comparison to typical EPC projects since, since this, is, uh, this was a PPP project. And again, some, some photos of uh, uh, the municipality of Kostrena and uh, the before and after the, the reconstruction. So some key findings or, or lessons learned uh, from, from uh, our activities. So uh, design and build and EPC are suitable for smaller projects, of course. Uh, project preparation is not so big as, as in PPP, which is suitable for, for bigger projects, typically over five, 5 million euros or even uh, uh, la larger ones. Uh, quality inputs in terms of data is essential for uh, solid preparation of these projects for uh, ESCOs to get interested, so we have to have uh, good energy audits. We prepared the methodology for detailed public uh, lighting energy audits, uh, and it's really a key for building the, the ESCO confidence in, in these projects, to, go, to get them to, to, to get into, into these projects and uh, to, to to start uh, involving. Uh, so it's also important to have an understanding from the ESCO market players regarding contractual models. So we have prepared, uh, drafted ESCO contracts. We have commented uh, on them with uh, potential ESCO, so to get their feedback uh, to really uh, have a contract which is uh, acceptable to, to all parties. And we feel it's quite important to, to include life cycle analysis 
lifecycle cost analysis in, in all of these projects. So uh, should be, uh, it's our opinion and experience should be should become an obligatory part for, for all projects, both ESCOs and, and not ESCOs, to, to really have a good basis for comparison. Tendering documentation, well, needs to be standardized, but also needs to be custom fitted, so to, to find the right balance there. And uh, uh, it's really a matter of carefully prepare, preparing this documentation, uh, paying a lot of attention to technical legal details, uh, all, all that uh, actually Christiane elaborated in more detail in, in her presentation. That, that's also our experience from Croatia. And we actually use some GIS tools when uh, uh, preparing energy audits. Uh, to get a better collection of info, to get standardized data, and uh, uh, to have really comparable results, and in the end, build confidence of ESCO market players. And uh, lastly, I would like to shortly present uh, uh, another project which we are implementing. It, it's not uh, implemented through Streetlight EPC, but it's implemented through LNI. It's a much uh, bigger project, but just to give you an overview. So basically, based on our experience through Streetlight EPC, we managed to, to start uh, uh, the new LAT project, which is a reconstruction of uh, street lighting in 57 Croatian cities and municipalities. And uh, some basic facts uh, started in October 2015, lasts for three years. The final be beneficiaries are uh, the cities and municipalities. However, uh, we have applied to, to Elena on behalf of all of them, and we have signed the, the final contract with, with Elena. The overall goal is to get investment of 20 million euros in reconstruction of street lighting uh, systems. Uh, so this is the total budget of the new light project, and 90% is co-financed through Elena. The other 10% is co-financed through our two counties on which we are uh, implementing project activities and which are our uh, founders. So within these two counties are the 57 cities and municipalities. Uh, the main activities uh, are grouped in three phases, implementation of energy audits, which we are uh, nearly uh, completed. Uh, we have started preparation of ESCO or PPP documentation preparation, and uh, in the second part of this year, we will la launch the first tenders for the actual reconstruction. And really the key feature of this project, why it's important, why uh, we feel it's a good replication model uh, for other parts of Croatia, but also e other EU countries, it's, it's bundling. So uh, we actually managed to get together 57 um, cities, municipalities, different political options, uh, 57 mayors in, in one project, uh, to really to, to, to get them together, uh, providing a better investment opportunity, lower, much lower transaction costs, uh, lower reduced risks. Of course, there are challenges, but uh, we also like to, to think of them as, as opportunities. And with this, uh, I would like to thank you for, for your attention, and uh, of course, I'm open to, to questions. Thank you very much, Vladimir. A lot of experience has been gained uh, in the last uh, few years. Thank you for, for sharing it uh, with us and with the participants. Um, what I'll ask is uh, maybe Christian Egger, can you also share your webcam and we can start a final Q&A section, um, Q&A, yeah, Q &A, uh, stage. Um, so we have one question that has been directed directly to uh, Velimir. So what are the differences between the EPCS code project and the PPP lighting projects you have presented? Well, the PPP project, each PPP project has to undergo a very uh, specific, specific procedure. It's defined by, by our PPP law, which we have in Croatia, by sub-laws. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, the documentation for PPP has to be approved by a special state agency for PPP, by the Ministry of Finance. Only after then, uh, a city can launch a tender for the selection of a private partner. 
So it's very strict, very prescribed, and in the end, if everything is done according to, to specifications, the net result should be that this is not public debt and should be acceptable to, to Eurostat not to count it as, as public debt. In order to, to achieve that, you have all sorts of criteria uh, regarding risk allocation, regarding the 50% the which was mentioned by, by Johan, I think, uh, investment volume. It's uh, really uh, the detailed criteria which you have to achieve to be uh, eligible as, as a PPP project. But as I said, the final result is that it, it's not counted as public debt. So that's perhaps the main uh, benefit compared with, with EPC. So EPC is, is simpler. Uh, we have a, a, a legislation in EPC, it's a, it's a sub-law, but it defines the minimum requirements of an EPC contract. It's not that strict. You don't have to undergo such a complicated procedure, so, so it's faster. But if you undergo this, it's counted as public debt if you're a city municipality. So I think that's, that's the main difference. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Um, I invite all the participants to ask their questions right now on the overall project, maybe all the presentations, the first presentation as well. Uh, don't hesitate to ask them. Um, do um, the coordinator of the project have any any remarks consider concerning what uh, what has been presented by the European Commission and by the final speaker? Christian? Yes, well, um, I think we all listened well to what Timothy said about the Eurostat guidance note. Uh, so uh, I think we, in this project and many other uh, around Europe who are participating in this webinar, uh, we follow this very closely. So uh, certainly Federen, uh will keep you all updated on that if there are any news on that. Uh, and so I think this is, this is an important issue. The second important issue I took away from uh, Timothy was that indeed uh, EPC remains and, and innovative financing remains a key uh, policy approach. And uh, I think that is also very encouraging. Uh, so I think in overall terms, we are well positioned uh, with the activities that we have carried out in these nine regions uh, to be among the early adopters of the new EU policies. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for those, uh, these concluding remarks. I don't see any new questions coming in. Um, I think, uh, well, I would have one question. Uh, we have seen that EPC can mean many things. How, how do you, how have you managed to, to work together uh, with such different contacts and well, with such different contracts, types of contracts? How can you uh, encourage your application uh, between yourselves, among yourselves uh, uh, with different uh, situations? I think that's actually the positive thing, that we have different situations. Uh, but what we find often an issue did not arise only in one region, but actually in two, three, four. So they could share uh, their solutions. Uh, and actually the variety of the implemented EPC project is also a result of the exchange in this project so that you could be inspired from other regions and their experience on other solutions. Because EPC is not a standard thing that only works in one specific way, uh, in very prescribed uh, procedures. But actually, it's a very flexible instrument, depending on the legal, the technical, uh, the financial, the contractual, uh, the social environment. And I think this project and the experience from it put us in a position to maximize or start maximizing the benefit uh, of this instrument by sharing the different solutions and challenges among us. Thank you. This is positive. This is optimistic. This is very, this is very, a very good conclusion to our webinar. 
Um, thank you, thank you all the, thank you to all the participants for your uh, for your presence and for your questions. Um, not sure, Christian, if you have any concluding remarks. Uh, do you want to, uh, to say anything else? Add anything else? Uh, I just wanted to thank you, the speakers, um, the participants who uh, remained with us, uh, which is quite unusual for a webinar. So uh, that's very good. I think that's a good feedback. And of course, I want to thank Federen uh, for um, hosting this seminar and also our project partners. I would highlight uh, many of them are still online uh, and us as the project coordinators and Federen are uh, at your service uh, to share the experience of the project and to inspire and support other regions to follow our example. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this concludes our webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. bye.